，方上和尚，现场及线上的各位贵宾们，大家早上好。全球暖化所导致的气候变迁是当前重要的国际议题。一百多年来，人类工业化，燃烧大量的石化燃料，如煤炭、汽油等。向大气排放了大量的二氧化碳等温室气体，加上大量砍伐森林，降低了地球吸收二氧化碳的能力，使得大气累积太多的温室气体，造成全球平均气温的上升，一百年来上升了摄氏一度 C。地球变暖了，导致急需海冰和冰山大量融化，海平面上升，沿海陆地被淹没，极端天气如豪雨、水灾、旱灾等频繁发生，影响生态，粮食危机，森林大火，疾病蔓延。这已经是我们必须面对的迫切危机。2010年，第二十六届联合国气候变迁大会呼吁， 2050年温室气体近零排放，逐步施行淘汰燃煤，控制甲烷排放，保护森林，全球碳市场交易等。台湾也即将立法，明定二零五零年要达到温室气体净零排放的目标。这些措施势必对我们的社会、经济、产业、人民生活产生巨大冲击。本次论坛邀请各领域的学者、专家及法鼓山法师们，透过跨世代。跨领域的对话，讨论在面临气候变迁所引发的社会、经济、生活的严峻变动下，如何运用圣严师傅所提倡的心灵环保核心价值，积极推动人类社会的再提升。因为经济资源的过度开发，造成了。人类生存环境的快速恶化，人类努力于人跟人争，人跟天争，改革社会，征服自然，却忽略了内心价值观的调整，以及欲望的节制，来修正改善。心灵环保是提倡好心好世界。从自我成长到整体关怀，节能减碳从我自己做起，根本环保从心开始。圣言教基金会成立的宗旨就是要推广圣言师傅的心灵环保理念，来回应现代社会所面临的诸多问题，实践人间净土的理想。今年是圣严师傅推动心灵环保三十周年，圣机会特别举办今天的气候变迁与心灵环保论坛。非常感谢中央气象局、中央研究院环境变迁研究中心、台湾永续能源研究基金会及。巨界节能股份有限公司与我们一起筹备这次论坛，当然也要感谢各位主持人、主讲者、语坛人及各位贵宾支持参加。相信所有听众一定会有许多的收获。最后，预祝大会成功，也祝福各位贵宾阖家身心平安。谢谢大家。基金会蔡董事长，还有我们呃参加呃这次呢
呃，由我们圣基会所主办的呃气候变迁与新型环保的啊，所有呃嘉宾、政府长官、呃诸位呃专家、呃学者，还有我们呃呃企业界的呃诸位先进、呃，当然有几位呢，也是我们呃生物堂的法师呢，呃、共襄盛举、呃，共同参与。那还有我们呃，非常感谢呃中央气象局，还有呢呃中央研究院环境变迁研究研究中心跟呢呃台湾永续能能源研究基金会，共同来协办啊这一次的论坛，呃第三年的疫情的进行，那对全世界的冲击，我们已经呢啊、呃、都感受到。那气候的变迁呢？它比这一次的两年、三年疫情呢，它的影响呢更具有呃全面性、更深、更远、更广。那我们呢，也可以说全世界呢，呃，所有的人类呢，呃，需要呢，共同来呢，呃，应对，来呃克服。那这边呢，我有几句话，我提出来，我们呢，呃，共同勉励。那第一个是呢，呃，感恩大地，爱惜自然。那第二个是呢，少欲知足，勤劳简朴。第三呢，和敬共存，公治。实践，那最后呢，就是呢，智慧处事，呃，慈悲待人。啊，事实上这，这这呃四句话就是我们呃法鼓山创办人呃圣严师傅所提倡的呢，四种环保。那感恩大地，爱惜自然，那就是我们呢、呃，自然环保。那因为人类的一种呢，科技的呃发明发展。应用，那也就是我们的一种呢，经济、生活、消费的一种形态，那就是变成了，呃，大量制造、大量生产，还有呢，大量消费，然后呢，呃，大量废弃、大量制造、大量生产的过程呢？大量消耗我们大自然的资源、能源，所以种种的一种呢排放，那变成我们呃今天的一种呢呃非常紧迫、严重的一种呢后果。所以我们以佛法的立场来说呢，我们大自然环境实际上是我们人类共同的一种呢。大身体，我们人类所需要的，从大地，从大自然呢、啊，来呢，呃，取用。但是事实上，它是我们共同的身体，所以我们每一个人呢、啊，应该有责任呢、啊，来爱护它，保护它，而且我们呢，应该要呢，感恩大地，感恩大自然。要呢，要珍惜大自然，否则我们呃这一代就可以看到一种呢所谓的呃大自然向人类反扑的这一种呢啊、呃、现象，渐渐渐渐出现，而且我们呢呃的后一代子子孙孙，我们呢应该呢有责任，呃所以的让他们能够永续在地球上。生存，啊，经营，那这是呢，呃，从呃自然的环保来说，第二个就是呢，呃，少欲知足，勤劳简朴，那就是呢，呃，生活环保，我们所谓的一种呃消费经济的一种活动呢，就是我们人类的一种呢，呃，贪求，贪欲。
那可以自然环境啊，啊予取予求，还有还有呢，啊破坏，所以造成一种，呃、啊、大自然整体的生态的，呃、啊、失调，那变成倒过来，影响我们呢、啊，人类自己，所以，呃、啊、有句话说，少欲知足，还有呢。呃，就是少欲，知足就能够呢，是最大的一种，呃，快乐。那特别在佛法里面呢、啊，我们在比丘戒律里面呢、啊，我们呃非常的呢，啊尊重，不但说是众生皆有佛性，那我们有句话就是说呢，草木呃皆有佛性，我们有一用用这种呢，呃心情心态来呢。对待，呃，大自然，那我们能够呢，呃，节约我们的资源、能源，我们所用的物资，那是非常呃不容易的。那第三句，呃，叫做呢，呃，和敬，呃，相处，呃，也就是呢，呃，和敬共存，呃，公治实践，那事实上就是呢，和敬相处。呃，从我做起的意思，呃，我们法鼓山来讲呢，我们在我们的园区里面呢、啊，如果有来过人知道啊，我们在法鼓山的山上，很不容易看到垃圾。那原因呢，我们山上呢，也是我们创办人智慧呢，我们山上，呃，几乎是看不到垃圾桶了。那没有垃圾桶，那所以来这边的人呢，没有机会丢垃圾。那当然就，呃，不会制造垃圾了。所以像这样的一种呢，呃，观念、理念呢，我们每个人都能够呢，从我做起，公司实践。那这样的话，我们能够呢，呃，付自己行动，而不是说只是呢，永远在呢，呃，讨论，呃，永永远在呢，呃，就是说，呃，这个，呃，没错，应该做，但是呢，呃，不是从我做。如果这样的话，我们永远没办法。来解决呢，呃，气候变迁、地球暖化的问题。啊，当然最重要的是呢，也就是呢，以慈悲对待人，以智慧智慧处理事。那佛法告诉我们，我们呃所有一切的宇宙啦、天地啦，都不出于人的心，所以事实上，安定。安顿人心呢是更重要的，还有我们心能够安定、安顿之后呢，我们对一种物质的欲望、追求啊，自然呢啊就会减少。还有你慈悲对待人，那在啊地球暖化啊变迁之下，那特别是呢呃贫穷的国家、资源的。呃，非常少的国家，或者是像那些呢，呃，在呃海洋上，那个它的海拔很低的国家，它已经面对一种呢，攸关，呃，生死存亡的一种关键了。那像这样的一种状况呢，那我们，也就是呢，全世界各国应该我们要以慈悲心、慈悲心呢，来支持、支援他们，还有以智慧处理事，那。啊，科技也是然带来我们对环境变迁暖化的一种影响呢，也可以说它是最重要的关键呐。呃，正如呃创办人呃摄影师所说的，用科技，用种种的科学方法呢，它还是没办法根本解决问题，也就是它能够治标，但是没办法治本。治本呢，还是要从人性的一种呢。改变，呃，转化，来开始，那我们呢、啊，也就是呃，泡果山，那就提倡，也就是我们呢、啊，呃，重新做起，重新开始。那这样子，这样子的话，我们呃，从呃教育，从各方面呢、啊，来努力。那我想我们呢、啊，那地球还是有希望的。所以今天我们非常感谢，呃，诸位长官，诸位贵宾的。莅临，还有特特别是什么呢？疫情的关系，网络上，呃，同步呃参与
呃观赏或者是讨论的，呃，诸位先进，呃，菩萨，呃，法师大德，呃，上次次，我们呢，呃，共同来呢，呃，回向，还有我们更重要的，我们要共同来呢，呃，身体力行，呃，谢谢大家的呃聆听，祝大家健康、快乐、平安、幸福，阿弥陀佛。呃，法鼓山呃，方大和尚回法师，还有圣严教育基金会蔡董事长以及各位学者专家嘉宾啊、嗯，大家早安。呃，我们非常高兴呢、啊，能够邀请到美国法鼓山佛教协会的常寂法师来担任我们这次气候变迁与心灵环保论坛的主题演说者。嗯，请容我先简单的介绍常寂法师。长吉法师是华裔加拿大籍，那在法鼓山出家，成为宗教师呢的服务奉献呢、啊、有超过十八年了。啊，法师担任过呃法鼓山及美国法鼓山佛教协会创办人圣严法师的国际事务特助，然后也是现任啊、呃、该协会在联合国的代表。法师曾经出席会议，还有举办周边周边会议，包含。啊、呃，宗教啦、啊，各类的国际青年培力的会议啊，等等。那法师在世界上这个，呃，致力于这个教导青年的行动啊、呃，还有这个呃，成为就是青年领袖啊，带领这类活呃领域的呃工作方啊，有很多。那法师也在世界各地啊出席，那主持青年领袖活动等课程。像从二零零九年开始啊，每年就代表呃法鼓山参加联合国气候变迁纲要公约所主办的气候变迁会议，啊、呃，然后从二零一六年也开始出席联合国经济及社会理事会主办的可持续发展目标会议啊，所以呃，我们非常期待法师今天的主题演说。那就请啊，长吉法师来给我们主题演讲。Hello, everyone. I'm Changji. In the spirit of the trees, the spirit of all living nature, I want to welcome you to this forum on climate change and protecting the spiritual environment, as we celebrate the 30th anniversary of protecting the spiritual environment. This forum was convened around the crisis we're currently facing on our endangered planet, our endangered species, our endangered ecosystem. The survival of our human species is at stake. At the UN, a lot of references were made about plus 1.5 degrees Celsius, plus 2 degrees, and plus 3 degrees global warming. What do they really mean? According to the scientists at the UN IPCC and the WMO, if we don't take any remedial action and continue business as usual, we're looking at a four degrees global warming from pre-industrial levels by the end of the century, 2100. That means, for the most of us, we would still be alive to experience this. What does the world look like at four degrees warming? Scientists have warned that the world, when the world warms to plus three degrees or higher, nature will behave very differently. Instead of helping to regulate the planet's temperature in the way we understand it, it will contribute towards runaway climate change. Instead of absorbing more carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen into the atmosphere through the leaves of plant life. They will absorb oxygen and release more carbon dioxide into the air, thus increase the volume of greenhouse gases in our Earth's atmosphere. Oceans, another source of carbon dioxide scrubbers, would become too acidic from absorbing so much carbon dioxide that it can no longer sustain life underwater. Also, as large bodies of ocean warms up, sea ice. And glacial melt would be so massive that more ice will disappear and not return. When that happens, 
more water surface will be exposed and the oceans will absorb even more heat and become warmer. As water warms up, it expands and sea levels will rise at alarming rates. The world's most populous urban centers, the coastal cities, will be inundated, triggering massive forced human migration. As sea level rises, natural fresh water will heat and will become be contaminated by seawater. And life on land will be severely threatened as our fresh water supply dwindles. We're looking at a world that is warming up, drying up, experiencing more and more severe weather events. Water and food supply will dry up. Massive exodus of environmental refugees inland, so on and so forth. Society will begin to break down and tensions will increase. A world at plus three degrees warmer would be the beginning of the end of the world as we know it. By then, we can no longer turn down the thermostat of the planet. The Earth's natural systems will contribute towards the anthropocentric climate change and herald in the beginning of hell on Earth for our human species. After years of negotiations, 2015, member states of the UN passed the Paris Agreement in which 193 countries commit to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to cap global temperatures at no more than two degrees warming by the end of this century. But that is not good enough for small island developing states. They have provided scientific evidence showing that any warming above plus 1.5 degrees, they would lose their homes, their islands. And this might include Taiwan too. A positive outcome from this year's UN meetings is that now member states are more committed to try to keep global warming to no more than plus 1.5 degrees warmer. What is our current warming? Per the WMO, in 2021, the Earth's mean temperature has warmed up 1.1 degrees from pre-industrial levels. This means we're not far from 1.5 degrees. So it is of grave urgency that every single one of us act now. It is not going to happen in the distant future. It will happen within our lifetime. We have several esteemed experts in the fields of climate change and environmental science and policy who will be speaking in different panels today. They will speak to more of the science behind climate change. In this keynote, I will examine the harsh realities of a, mar of a money culture, a death economy that promoted materialistic consumerism. By looking at the four environments promoted within the protecting the spiritual environment framework and putting the pieces of the puzzle together, it could reveal how our own perceptions and the ways our beliefs have limited and constricted our relationship with nature we can then reconceptualize life on this planet and realign our relationship with nature. The Four Environments examines the inner landscape of our own humanity, spiritual environment, provides insights about our relationship with one another, social environment, and the space we live in, living environment, and tells us of the wisdom embedded in the earth and the natural world, natural environment. Put them together, it offers a more holistic way of viewing life. The first three environments, spiritual, social, and living environments, are anthropocentric in focus, while the fourth environment, natural, expands our relationship beyond humans towards all sentient beings. We are nature. Biologically, we are made from the same elements as all life on this planet. Everything we do, we do it because nature has already done it. The neural networks in our brain aren't separate nor distinct from nature. They're basically a replication at a certain level of complexity of what nature's been using for millions of years. 
throughout most of the 250,000 years of human history. Every one of us comes from a heritage where we knew that we are part of nature. It's only been within the last blink of an eye, historically speaking, that we've been that we've developed this bizarre cognitive dissonance that somehow we are apart from and superior to nature. One of the consequences of this is the creation of the death economy, where short-term profits and un and unending materialistic consumerism are priorities. This is likened to a caterpillar. It is a voracious eater. However, our relationship with nature, just like our relationship with each other, are fundamental to whether we're going to survive as a species and craft together with nature a more abundant and thriving future. Currently, we're facing a triple planetary crisis. I quote from the UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, this triple planetary crisis has been caused by the climate emergency that is killing and displacing ever more people each year, biodiversity loss, which threatens more than 3 billion people, and pollution and waste that is costing some 9 million lives a year. So although the news is dark and stark, however, it is also an invitation for our human race to metamorphosize from a voracious consumer caterpillar into a butterfly that gives life. That's part of the conversation we want to have today. And what are the things that have prevented us from doing the right thing? How can we strike a balance between the needs of nature and the economic and societal needs of humanity. I would propose moving from the current death economy to a life economy. What are the characteristics of a death economy? Our current economic situation within the context of the four environments in protecting the spiritual environment. How does the death economy manifest within our lives or within ourselves? in our relationship with others, in our relationship to the setting of our living space. For example, urban versus rural, or global north versus global south, so on and so forth. And also, in our relationship with other sentient beings sharing this planet with us. In a death economy, the fundamental invisible value and worldview we embody is the perception of insufficiency and inadequacy. Whether true or not, that thought of not enough occurs to us automatically before we even think to question or examine it. In Buddhism, we call it dukkha or unsatisfactoriness. We spend most of the hours and the days of our lives hearing, explaining, complaining, or worrying about what we don't have enough of. We don't have enough profits, power, money, smartness, pretty, educated, or successful enough. Underlying these are fear and a sense of separation and isolation with a focus on the individual's fulfillment. These unconscious embodied inner values are then manifesting in our daily interactions with others. Due to the fear of not enough and inadequacies, there is a need for control and coercion through competition and even cooperation because we view others as objects to fulfill our own goals. Will they benefit or threaten my goals? In the living environment, it is an economic system that is built on the goal of maximizing short-term materialistic consumption and short-term corporate profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs, regardless of the destruction that it can cause to the environment, to nature, and to humans. Its concept of success is short-term maximization of profits and consumerism. So sadly, it's created an economic situation globally that is essentially consuming itself into extinction. Thus, a death economy. 
It is a dying economy because in the short term, we are consuming the very things that we need for the long term. So for example, most executives in big corporation don't expect to be there for very long. Longevity is not part of the job. So their total focus is on maximizing short-term profits. And that often means destroying the sustainability of resources that it depends on, as well as the long-term sustainability of all of us on the planet. So a death economy is one that is destroying itself ultimately by consuming its life-sustaining systems like a caterpillar. We all know it's what's causing we all know it's what's causing climate change in the in inequality of income, species extinctions, and the pandemic. All the crises that we are facing are symptoms of this death economy. Today, we have this perception that success is defined by materialistic consumption and profits, short-term profits. So to create a life economy, we need to move to a new perception that says success is about maximizing long-term benefits for people and nature. And that's how we measure it. We pay people to clean up pollution, to figure out ways to mine all the plastic that is floating around in oceans and reuse it, to regenerate destroyed environments, to recycle to develop and create technologies that don't ravage the earth. But before we jump hastily into these actions, we must look deeply at also revising our relationships via the four environments for real metamorphosis to occur. If not, it's just merely behavioral change. As Albert Einstein said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Within ourselves, our inner journey, we need to shift from insufficiency and inadequacy to sufficiency and adequacy. When that happens, our fear and isolation transform into love and wholeness. By sufficiency, I don't mean a quantity of anything. Sufficiency is a context we bring forth from within that reminds us that if we look around us and within us, we will find what we need. There is always enough, even in the presence of genuine scarcity of external resources. When we turn our attentions into our inner resources, that we can begin to see more clearly the sufficiency within us and available to us and we can begin to generate effective sustainable responses to whatever limitations resources confront us when we let go of the chase for more and more is still not enough and we consciously examine and experience the resources we already have we discover our resources are deeper than we knew or imagined there is no not enough, nor we are not good enough. We are enough. And we can tap into that to grow in our capacities. Just like the imaginal cells in a chrysalis, the caterpillar dissolves into a soupy organic matter and the DNA expression of the caterpillar disappears. Then suddenly one day, the DNA expression of a butterfly awakens in the organic matter and cells multiply and a butterfly is created. As we dissolve our self-egos in anthropocentric focus, we realize that we are no longer just separate individuals. We view the universality of life on this earth as one web of life and we are part of this web. When we are in this kind of space, we then relate to others differently. Instead of the need to control, we love. Instead of the need to 
coerce. We inspire others. Instead of competition, we value partnership. Instead of cooperation for an outcome, we care about others, genuinely care about their dreams and hopes. If we can manifest these new relationships within ourselves and with others, then we can birth forth a life economy, a new living environment that could clean up the pollution and regenerate destroyed environments in a way that create a natural environment that sees us as being part of rather than a part of nature. Of course, whenever there's a revolution or change, there is pushback by status quo because the status quo is scared. The oil companies are scared. The coal companies are scared. And all the politicians who represent them are scared. In my experience of doing this work and inspiring young people who are engaging in change work, good agents of change always take the pushback as something to give us strength. It is so easy to put the blame on corporations, on institutions or organizations, on governments, making them the villains and making ourselves the victims of this system. Utilizing the four environments framework, we learn that we have this system that makes it very, very difficult for presidents anywhere to go against the system. If they go against the system or they do not perpetuate the system, they can be destroyed one way or another. And that's a very scary thing. We can justify it as it's all because these corporations have so much power and because we are victims of the system. But we are also collaborators in the system. A lot of it is done because we just don't understand what's going on. We're kept too busy and too distracted to pay attention to it. But by being collaborators, we're supporting a system that is ultimately destroying life on this planet. The global catastrophes, the pandemic, the war, natural disasters, breaking down of established institutions is an opportunity to open the door for a new understanding and letting us know that we must move in a new direction. I think that what we forget as citizens, as we the people, is that we have much more power than we exercise. And one of the things we seem to be afraid of is we're afraid of paying a short-term price to get a long-term gain. Let me repeat this. We are afraid of paying a short-term price to get a long-term gain. Because if we don't act, if we keep letting this drama play out as if we were watching a performance of some kind, we're not interacting in it, we're not affecting it, then we're just going to collude in our own demise. So, if we want to move into this life economy, we're going to have to change the perception and then the actions. Perception creates reality. Perception and our mindsets are what drives us. I think most people have already got the perceptual change in the backs of their minds. If not, in the front of their minds. B corporations, benefit corporations, the, new, the Green New Deal, um, conscious capitalism, all of these things. This changing perception should include both nature and society. It should include the natural order and the social order. So we can reach out to people and change the perception of what it means to be successful humans on this planet. We're not products of consumerism with only one objective, to consume mindlessly. We need to believe that true humanity has a heart. A caterpillar exists to eat and feeds voraciously. Its aim is to consume as much as possible. When there's nothing left to devour, evolution forces its isolation into becoming chrysalis, within which it dissolves into in the breaking down of its old form. 
a new form begins to evolve into a butterfly. One morning, it breaks through the walls of its chrysalis. It waits for its wings to dry in the warmth of the sun. Then it flies. A butterfly exists to pollinate. Its aim is to sip the sweetness of flowers. And as it does so, it fertilizes life. I think we should all feel very, very blessed that we live in this time because we can turn things around. It's a time that has been prophesied by culture throughout the world. And we're all part of that. So let's enjoy it. Let's make the best of it. Let's do it. Let's take the actions and realize that we are very, very blessed to bring to bear certain things that will challenge perception, but that's required for us to gain deeper insight into truth. I end with a quote from Master Shen Yen. Many small good deeds will add up into a great deed. Thank you very much. And may you be safe, happy, healthy, and be at peace. Um, yes. <laughs> 呃,我刚刚好像觉得我在看了一场那个叫 National Geography的那个影片,看到都那个忘记了。Thank <笑> um, you so much for your inspiring speech. I do feel the crisis and urgency of climate change through your touching and caring voice. And yes, we need to take action. So, 谢谢法师关怀的语调所做的温暖的呼吁。一方面呢, 让我们看到气候变迁的危机还有火烧眉头的紧急性正式修正这些看似进步但事实上是自我毁灭的行为的良方。那么我想再请教这个长期法师哈，我们美国法鼓山佛教协会在过去几年哈，对于这个应用心灵环保理念来帮助气候变迁，大概有哪一些呃主要
um, and it transforms our relationship with people and the space we live in and also the natural world. And the next environment is natural environment. So in this, um, the focus is on interbeing. Nothing exists as a separate entity. So everything is connected to everything else. So interbeing is, uh, is the awareness that we are not separate from the earth, but rather we are the earth. What we do to earth, we do to ourselves and each other. And how we are with each other collectively is how we are with the earth. Um, a rainforest uh, young indigenous activist in one of our programs said, I try to remember that it's not me trying to protect the rainforest. Rather, I am part of the rainforest protecting itself. Very succinctly put. Uh, and the third environment is a uh, living environment in which the focus is on reintegration of silos. We can increasingly see how climate change highlights the interconnection between issues that were previously viewed as separate. So climate change is a, uh, a, a, a racial justice issue. It's a resource extraction issue. It's a food security issue. It's a national security issue. It's a, an economic justice issue. It's a public health issue. It's a population issue. It's a democracy issue. Wow. And it's an immigration issue. It's a technology issue. It's a gender equity issue. It's a species loss issue, a, a rights of the earth issue, and so on. So anything we care about is somehow related to climate change and environmental degradation. So the silver lining of climate change is that we now have the possibility of knitting together an integrated awareness that links all of these issues into a new understanding of our interconnectedness. And the last one is social environment in which the focus is about fostering human unity and solidarity. So why we continue to degrade the earth is that we continue to degrade each other. So as we heal and eliminate the wounds of all the um, isms, right? So like patriarchy, rankism, classism, so on, um, we will also be healing that which keeps us un in unhealthy relationship with the earth. So it's a reuniting of humans with the rest of the natural world. And one of the things I like to point out too is what we learned from these programs is one of the recurring themes that we realized in this work especially with young ecologists, is on the topic of powerlessness. So there's a huge barrier to humans mobilizing to limit harm and to change our relationship to the earth. And this barrier is the presence of deeply conditioned feelings of powerlessness in many people. Uh, let me, uh, Bill McKibben of 350.org puts it in this way, very succinctly too. He says, the crisis seems so big and we seem so small that it's hard to imagine that we can make a difference. So this feelings of powerlessness and living in a thoroughly oppressive society gives rise to separation. We get pitted against each other. We blame and shame others and we feel the need to protect our own and to go it alone, um, to compete, to get ahead. Right. So our families, social networks and communities break down. So we learned actually from our programs that building community is another necessary component of climate change work. So finding ways to unite across issues and to create multiracial and multi-class organizations, um, to develop deep communities of practice as sanctuaries, as think tanks as um, renewal spaces to help each other maintain loving kindness and compassion as climate, stre uh, climate stress mounts. So while, pretending, uh, while not pretending that it's complete, this is a work in progress. So DDMBA offers this framework of a mindful approach to climate change work in hopes that it is helpful to the wider movement. So it helps to think of the four environments as interacting with each other, none standing alone, but together it's forming a promising approach. 
So I would like to thank the uh, Shenyan Education Foundation for inviting me. It's my honor to share my humble views with you and may it be of benefit. Thank you, Professor Deng. Um, thank you very much, Venerable Changji. Changji Bashi Shuahu,如果我们要介绍过去几年美国法鼓山国家协会,他怎么样用心理环保来帮助气候变迁,那我们可能还要再谈两个小时。不过简单的总结一下,就是,把时刚刚举例来说明,新理环保对气候变迁